Hello, and welcome to the Three Links Oddcast, your podcast for all things having to do with Odd Fellowship. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Three Links Oddcast. I'm your host, Toby Hansen. I'm Ainsley Heilick, and we are here today with special guest host, Christopher McHale. Hello, it's always a pleasure to be here. And Toby, yes, MC of at All Things Odd Fellowship, why don't you do the honors of introducing our guest for the evening? I would be honored to, brother. We have a very special guest joining us here on the Three Links Oddcast, and that is brother Seth Anthony from Pennsylvania. Say hello, brother. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to join you tonight. Excellent. So uh, to start out, um, I'm sure probably not all of our listeners know who you are because we we have listeners in Sweden. So if you could uh, take a moment and give us a, a little short biography of yourself as an odd fellow and a fraternalist, that would be great. Sure, happy to. I'm afraid my Swedish chef impression is uh, lackluster at best, <laughs> so they will have to settle for, for uh, lame English, as it were. Uh, I'm a member of Triune Lodge, number 307 in Middletown. I'm currently the recording secretary, having just come off two years as, uh, as Noble Grand. I'm also the senior warden of Middletown Encampment, number 10, and the lieutenant of York Canton, number 14 in York, Pennsylvania. Uh, a job I was randomly appointed to and have no, no credentials or experience for outside of being a member, uh, but certainly enjoy my time in Odd Fellowship amongst many other fraternal organizations that I'm involved with. Uh, I would say uh, of all things, I'm a fraternalist with a, a deep interest in fraternal organizations and keeping the history of these organizations alive and the value that they, they bring to society. That is awesome. Uh, we, of course... We love fraternalism. We love getting together and we love putting on cool hats. And as I understand it, you have a certain amount of background when it comes to uh, social clubs and other groups for odd fellows to join. If by cool hats you mean a fez, the, then yes, I am the, the owner and sole proprietor of fezmuseum.com the internet's largest, best, and only uh, Fez website, uh, where I've detailed uh, the history of over 200 fraternal Fezes from many, many organizations. Uh, Fezes are sort of the, the thing that got me into fraternalism and that I love to share and talk about. And the Odd Fellows uh, prodigiously produced Fez wearing groups, especially in the 1920s and provided a fascinating history and background for me to dive into. All right, so Odd Fellowship, is, as we know it in the Independent Order, it goes back to 1819 in Baltimore. Um, and then a couple of years later, the encampment got going. How long after that uh, did we start to have these kind of social clubs and uh, other side degrees and side orders for Odd Fellows? Great question. So the the... The history and background of the social orders for Odd Fellows, uh, a lot of it is lost to the mists of time. And there's some varying history on this. And I often talk about the old quote that history is written by the victors, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, guys who, the guys who survived are the ones who say, this is the official history, this is the way it was. But when you really start digging at some of that history, it doesn't necessarily stand up to... Uh, academic rigor, so to speak, just like many of these fraternal groups. It, it behooves you to say we were the first, the biggest, and the best, and that might not have actually been the case. Uh, so the kind of the first glimpse of this history you get, if you were to read the official history of the ancient mystic order of Samaritans, they talk about the earliest record of the Oriental Order of Humility, from which they're descended, coming from November 18th of 1865. The, the, the simple answer to that is yes and no. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the Oriental Order of Humility is not an Odd Fellows invention. It is merely a side degree that was perpetuated amongst many of these organizations, especially in the 1860s to the 1890s. 
And we know this for an absolute fact, uh, thanks to, of all things, the Damolan Museum, and shout out to John Goldsmith and the Damolan folks, uh, because of an 1893 ritual book that's in my collection, and John also has a copy of in his, that is essentially the Oriental Order of Humility as it would become in 1903 when it became an Odd Fellows thing, the degree is almost entirely lifted from that 1893 version of the ritual. So sure, it, the Oriental Order of Humility does date from the 1860s and it was used many times over, but it really didn't become an Odd Fellows thing until much later in the actual scheme of things. Okay, so that takes us up to uh, early 20th centuries. And <clears throat> you called it the Oriental Order of Humility. But I, I've i heard of OOH and P. So where does the P come from? Yeah, so a so couple of things happen here. And really, we have Freemasonry to thank for a lot of this. Thank in, you, Freemasonry. <laughs> yeah. In the 1870s and up in, in New York City, you get the foundation of uh, the ancient, uh, the, the Shriners and uh, AOMS, whatever it was, now Shriners International, they don't use that anymore. Uh, and then shortly thereafter in the late 1880s, early 1890s, you get the Mystic Order of Veiled Prophets of the Enchanted Realm or the Grotto, which is founded in Hamilton, New York. All of this to tell me how boring was Freemasonry in New York State in the 1890s <laughs> that they needed to keep founding organizations to entertain themselves. Uh, it all sort of perpetuates in that area. From an Odd Fellows standpoint, the first Fez wearing organization that was truly Odd Fellows, as far as we can tell, was actually the Imperial Order of Muscovites that was founded in, in Ohio on May 18th, 1894. They predate the Oriental Order of Humility and Perfection by about a decade or so. Um, so th they're really the first ones that, that did their thing and there's a whole history that goes with them. Uh, what you're referencing, the order, Oriental Order of Humility and Perfection was founded in the spring of 1901, actually in Canada. It, it wasn't originally an American invention and spread down from Toronto through the, the Northeastern United States and did its thing. And then of course the Muscovites were doing their thing. And everybody at that time said, man, I love me some funny hats. We should have a funny hat, hat order of our own. And it sort of blew up much beyond the control of the Sovereign Grand Lodge. Okay, so Sovereign Grand Lodge, and this is one of those things that really easily differentiates odd fellowship and masonry. Masonry, each Grand Lodge is pretty much left to their own devices. There's no, sort of international coordinating body. But as Odd right. Fellows, we have the Sovereign Grand Lodge, which can come in and easily make a determination about something having to do with Odd Fellowship. And it applies everywhere. If you are a member of the Independent Order, you're under the Sovereign Grand Lodge, period, end of story. So how did that control from the Sovereign Grand Lodge impact all of these various side orders? So in April of 1910, uh, in your home state at a meeting of the Sovereign Grand Lodge in Seattle, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, they, they held their session and there was a, uh, there you go. There was a uh, meeting held of some prominent odd fellows, part of Sovereign Grand Lodge, where they looked at all this proliferation of side bodies and not just fez wearing bodies there's quite an extensive list of other things patriarchs militant imitators women's auxiliaries things that they said whoa there's just too much going on we need to stop this and there's actually a, a line that refers to all of these fez wearing bodies as a cheap imitation of the masonic shriners oh uh, no that, that is straight from the actual minutes they called it a cheap <clears throat> imitation uh sounds so, like something they'd say <laughs> <laughs> So in, in Portland, Oregon, on April 6th of 1910, the Grand Sire, the, the predicating title of Grand Master Kuykendall, who is from uh, Wyoming, made a, a public decree saying, all of this is done. No more side orders. If you're an odd fellow, you can't join any of this. No, it's a, we just can't do this. And like any good fraternal body, a year later, the next guy comes in and goes, eh, it's okay. Everybody can join that <laughs> stuff again. Get your fezzes back out. It's fine. 
Yeah. Right. Because like like every grand line that says, hey, we've talked to the whole grand line and we all agree this is the way it's going to be. As soon as the new guy goes in, he goes, ah, never mind. We're not going to get it. <laughs> so the, uh, that brings us up to 1910. And uh, the sovereign grand master at the time, or the grand sire as he was called then, he said, no, no more side orders with fezes. The next one says, oh, no, that's cool. Go ahead, guys. Do it. So that kind of uh, organizational whiplash, how does that affect the side orders and what happens to them following that? So the Odd Fellows uniquely have this regional thing that happens. Um, considering they're a national body with a national organization, it's interesting to see that this re regionalism occurs, especially compared to Freemasonry, that's truly a regional state level body where you don't see as much of this regionalism happen. So by 1910, 11, into the 19 teens, we're really in the heart of Odd Fellows social bodies happening. So if you think of a big map of the United States, you have the Oriental Order of Humility and Perfection just cruising along, taking over the world in the Northeastern United States generally from Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Maine, up, up through that region. And they had some lodges elsewhere, some sanctorums elsewhere, but that's really their, their base of operations is New York, Pennsylvania, that area. In the deep south, you get the, uh, the uh, order of splendor and perfection, which is really working in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, that area. Uh, in the Midwest, you get the uh, veiled prophets of Baghdad, kind of in the Arkansas, Missouri area. And they're one of the smaller ones. They're, there's not a lot of reference to them out there. They later became ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the Muscovites, although started in Ohio, really transitioned very early on in their existence to the Midwest and then especially the Northern Midwest during this period. So they're ruling things in in... Uh, South Dakota, Wyoming, Idaho, uh, over into Minnesota, kind of that Northern Plains states, that, that's their world, that's where they are. They also made really good inroads into the Pacific Northwest, but the Pacific Northwest after the 1910 stuff said, eh, we're gonna go be on our own. So we have the Imperial Order of Muscovites sort of happening in the middle part of the country and the Improved Order of Muscovites, because we need the same initials, but different names. Uh, working over in Washington and Oregon and really acting as separate organizations. And then to comp complicate it, just one more level, we have the Order of Kabiri operating in California, generally along the coast, more in the San Francisco area that developed out of a band, or at least the best we know, it was the band <laughs> of an Odd Fellows Lodge that said, we should all wear funny hats and play the tuba. Uh, and they got, that sounds they awesome. Their own, their own little thing. So we have this patchwork of individual fez wearing fraternal organizations kind of all operating in their own little ecosystem own little world through the early 19 teens okay so uh it sounds like we've got uh quite a variety of fun side degrees for odd fellows to take because in those days odd fellows lodges met every week your encampment would meet twice a month so you still had a few days available when you could go to um, your local Kremlin if you're a Muscovite. Um, so what happened that caused the kind of consolidation uh, that happened after this period? So much like any good fraternal body, uh, you can only be in charge so much as you are in charge of everything and everyone at all times. Uh, <laughs> The Odd Fellows leaders, uh, the Sovereign Grand Lodge leaders, went to the, the the social bodies and said, "Look, guys, we appreciate what you're doing. There's a lot of you. Uh, we can't figure out what's really going on here. So, how about crazy idea? You all consolidate and you form one body, and then we can like recognize you and do stuff, and everybody will be on the same page, right? Um, and, and that all happens in the early 1920s." Uh, especially 1923, 1924 range, they, they go to them and say, hey, we, we should really consolidate and start having these conversations and get this stuff in this stuff sorted out. So th the groups generally comply with that request and they, they start having these conversations. 
And this really comes to a fruition in 23 and 24 uh, when the Oriental Order of Humility and Perfection running, you know, they're the biggest of these running the, the, the Northeastern United States and the, the Muscovites in the Northern Midwest start having serious conversations around what a merger would look like. And then the other groups sort of fall in line going, okay, well, if they're gonna merge, we should probably talk about merging. But as you know, with any lodge merger, it all goes perfectly smooth. Everybody's happy with how the money's gonna be spent and the officer line will look, right? Uh, it's just a very simple process that everybody agrees on. It's never the case. No. Uh, yeah, it never quite goes that easily. So it takes them a couple of years just to figure out what's going on. And the really abbreviated version of this story is uh, in 1924, everybody agrees, hey, we should merge. They agree on the idea that they should have a distinctly American ritual. And that's right from the, the, the minutes that we know of. It's distinctly American. So out of all of this, they agree that they should form the United Order of Splendor and Perfection, UOSP. So obviously you can see the, the Oriental order, order of Humility and Perfection in that name. You can see the, the Knights of uh, Oriental Splendor in that name. It all, it all sort of starts to congeal. And they, they work for two years trying to figure out what's this group gonna look like. Because think about it, it's the 1920s. You know, you're doing things by telegram and by train. Uh, and if you wanted to make decisions, it was not an easy thing to do to decide like, hey, we're going to take this 50,000 member national body and merge it. Okay, you three guys, you're going to make a decision on how this works. So what happens is the Oriental Order of Humility and Perfection uh, appoints a committee and says this committee's allowed to bargain and barter for us but they have to come back to the national body and what they agree to has to be approved by the national body. That, that's how it's gonna work. So they're allowed to cut the deal, but they can't approve the deal. The Muscovites appoint three guys and say, hey, whatever these three guys say, we're gonna play along. Uh, we're, not, we're not gonna fuss with this, these are the guys. So they meet and they do their thing and they cut a deal and they have a plan how, how the United Order of Splendor and Perfection is gonna come about. Everything's like, looks like it's going hunky dory. And then around 1926, uh, the, there, there's some miscommunication, let's call it that. Uh, the Oriental Order of Humility and Perfection, their Supreme Clericus, their Supreme Secretary, uh, his understanding was everybody's becoming a member of the Oriental Order. And then we're gonna figure out what this American thing looks like, sends out per capita notices to uh -oh. all of these bodies yeah. and says, it's time to pay up. Thanks, everybody. And everybody revolts and says, whoa, we don't owe you anything. We agreed to a merger, not to a consolidation. So <laughs> it gets a much more complicated in that time frame as to what's actually happening with these groups. Out of that is born in 1926, the revised version of all of this of the ancient mystic order of Samaritans that continues to exist today. Uh, but it's a really tough decade or so from that point for the Samaritans. Most of the Oriental Order of, order of Humility and Perfection folks kind of go, okay, we're Amos now, we're Samaritans, fine. They transfer over and there's lots of Fez designs and things and that help us date, to date some of these Fezes. Meanwhile, the Muscovites basically say, eh, screw you guys. Uh, we're not doing that. We didn't yeah. agree to any of this. We're going to continue to operate in our own way in the northern Midwest. Uh, there's some remnants of the, the Knights of Splendor and Perfection and the Kabiri and those groups that continue to chug along for a couple of years, but it really comes down to the Muscovites and the Oriental Order of Humility and Perfection. Eventually, through the 1930s, slowly but surely, the Oriental Order subsumes what's left of the Muscovites outside of the Pacific Northwest, which we learned much later, uh, and they become the predominant group in the form of the ancient mystic order of Samaritans that we know we know today. Well, that's really interesting. So basically, um, by the time all the dust settled, there were two groups essentially for odd fellows. You could be a Samaritan, you could be a Muscovite. Yeah, and, and it's really dependent on where you live. Um, the, the interesting stories really do come out of that northern Midwest standpoint where you start to see 
the slow transition of what happened. So uh, a great example is Idaho and Utah. Uh, Kremlin Kazan was in Utah, Kremlin Kolo or Kremlin U Ufa, UFA was in Idaho. And you see reference to Kremlin Kazan and Ufa up through like 27, 28. And then magically the newspaper reports start to say Kazan Sanctorum, Ufa Sanctorum. Okay. And it, it's just this slow merger. We're like, okay, they've lost this one. They've lost this one. They've lost this one. And part of this is entirely the Muscovites fault because there's a lot of drama behind the scenes here in the Imperial order with embezzlement and insurance fraud and other issues that, that happen. So slowly but surely those Kremlins look around and go, we need to pick the winning team and the winning team doesn't seem to be the embezzlers at this point. So um, you described several of these side orders that I have not heard of yet. Um, so could you explain maybe a little bit of some of like the differences between the groups um, or like what information you know about each of them? Like, cause obviously they're all usually around a theme. Um, I was one of the folks who took the Muscovite uh, virtual degree recently. And I hope to have my Busby by today to wear for this uh, recording, but it's supposed to arrive tomorrow. Oh, oh no. Wow. But um, so so if, if you could kind of maybe explain some of the differences or like the kind of uh, themes or what was uh, kind of the, yeah, I guess the theme of each of these or, or what you know of each of these groups, because sure. like I haven't like the, the Baghdad one, I think that's that's one I'd never heard of. And being in Illinois, I, I'm just like, oh, that's interesting, you know, like a Midwest kind of thing. Um, and yeah, I, I would like, and the one with the tuba band, I, I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. So, so the Oriental Order of Humility and Perfection was really a, a, a shrine imitation in many ways. They took on the, the Middle Eastern themes that were very popular of the day. Uh, they referred to their member as tribesmen. Uh, the degrees of the Oriental Order of Humility and Perfection are really what survived today in the form of Amos. So if you're taking Amos degrees today, they're very similar to what the Oriental Order would have done back in the early 1900s. The, the Muscovites, you know, what, what exists today, uh, and David Shear, who's really spearheading the Muscovites thing in Oregon will tell you, the ritual you see today is a great homage to the ritual that would have been in the 19, early 1900s. It is much more sexist in its original form. Uh, no way. It called, from the 1920s, yeah, imagine that, early really? 1900s, uh, <laughs> it, it called for the use of flashbang grenades in the lodge. It's a very oh, wow. different version of the ritual. Uh, David was very kind to supply me with a copy of the original uh, for my collection of stuff. And while it, it plays in the same vein, very different version of, of what you saw. Uh, but interestingly, they're the only order that had this Russian motif out of all of these orders. Very different take on the idea of a fez wearing body being Russian. And I, I give the Muscovites credit, you know, you think they're founded in 1894, uh, not to give away too much about the degree which you can happily pay David $25 to see, but it centers around uh, a specific event uh, with a ruler of an organization. And lo and behold, in the early 1900s, prior to World War, one, what do we see? We see an Eastern European ruler uh, ass essentially assassinated after a grenade goes off. So you think about the early version of that degree and how prophetic it was with yeah. the, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. They tossed a grenade at his car and then assassinated him. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, this is a prophetic little degree in its own little way of, uh, of what's happening in Eastern Europe at that time. The the Knights of Splendor and Perfection in the Deep South were Egyptian themed. We know very little about them in the grand scheme of things outside of the fact that they had paid organizers that trotted around the Deep South and got paid to initiate members and create palaces. They met in a palace, a great name. Mm -hmm. um, we, the way we really learned about them, I had purchased a fez at auction. Their fezes are purple 
and it's sort of a shrinery looking logo with a, a big crescent star and some other things. If you look at my Fez Museum website, you can see pictures of them. I had purchased one of those many years ago. I had no idea what it was. It was like Osiris number one purple Fez thing. I went, oh, it's a weird Fez. It's from the early 1900s. Cool, it's part of the collection. Many years later, I was looking through a song book from the, the Orient, uh, the Knights of Splendor Perfection. I went, I know that logo. And I looked at the Fez and I looked at the song book and went, oh God, this is a Fez from the Knights of Perfection, the, the Knights of Splendor of Perfection. We didn't know this, the, the Knights of Splendor. So that's how we sort of connected the dots on who they were. Uh, they were very small. Later on, I was sent uh, some documents from a lodge in Tennessee that basically found a, a drawer of paperwork of ephemera with their logo and stuff still on it. And they sent me copies of all of that stuff uh, just to have in the collection. It's unsigned stuff really, but interesting nonetheless. The, uh, the group in the Midwest, the, the Veiled Prophets of Baghdad, I believe it's in St. Louis that every year they have a, uh, the Veiled Prophets Ball which is a civic organization that puts on this big ball and there's a, a veiled prophet and a queen. And it's, it's kind of a long running thing in St. Louis. So it's not, not uncommon to see that theme sort of percolate out to organizations in and around St. Louis. And that's, that, that is my unofficial historian opinion of probably where they got the name, uh, especially in the, the Arkansas, Missouri, Ozark area of the Veiled Prophets of Baghdad. We don't know much about them either. Uh, they were very tiny. I think I only have reference to maybe six or seven local bodies found through newspaper orders at best about them. Uh, very small, but they we, we know they existed. And then out on the West Coast, you had the Kabirians, which really came out of Oakland and they had a big band. Uh, the thing you often hear about Kabiri is the Kabiri band playing on the radio and what was happening with them. And what we do know is by April of 1925, we magically see Kabiri Sanctorum number 23 officially listed on the United Order of Splendor and Perfection roles. So they were very early adopters of, of the merger. They existed, they were this band, they probably wore fezes, had their little initiation thing. But very early on, they said, hey, we're going to do our thing. There was probably only one or two local units of them at best. Thank you. That is uh, really, it, it's just, it's really interesting because I, um, I, I, I'm sure most people who are odd fellows or have been following odd fellows have come across Amos. And if they're lucky enough to have dug deep enough, they've come across the Oriental Order of Humility and Perfection and also Muscovites, but it's interesting to realize that there's there were even more, and that's that's really that's something I did not know. This is the part of the history that I really enjoy, and history is all about connecting dots. And in in my work in Freemasonry and some of the the research bodies I'm involved in there, you get guys who want to plumb the depths of you know they want to be Indiana Jones, they want to go find the lost Illuminati ritual in a vault in oh. Germany somewhere, and like. That's not, it's cool, but there's very few guys who get to go be any Indiana Jones and do that. The uh, real I'll history, save them the time. It's under the airport in Denver. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? It's, it's where it's, it's under the horse. It's that big demonic yes. horse out in front of the airport. It, it's exactly. right next to the, uh, the spot that the Church of Scientology rents out to. <laughs> yeah, right. Very close. Very similar. Um, yeah. the, so, so the real history of these groups is tracking the local people and the local personalities and how that feeds up to some of the national politics that end up occurring and understanding, you know, Georgia was a completely different world than upstate New York in 1924. Like their values were different, their worlds were different, their economy was different, that they had a different need for a, a fez wearing fun body than Georgia and the upper Midwest and the Pacific Northwest and California and trying to understand all of these organizations and the people involved in the milieu that they lived in is really where the history comes in. Chris, you had a, you had a question, didn't you? I did. So, uh, I mean, they could have gone with bowler hats or, uh, you know, different yarmulkes or even those hard hats that have the two parts for the, uh, you know, 
soda cans or something on the sure. side. <laughs> uh, beer hats. Well, so I wasn't going to say beer. No, that's okay. Uh, We're all so over 21 I was, here. I was going to say Sunny <laughs> Delight or something like that. Uh, so why, why fezzes of, of all the things to make those catch on? Why fezzes? So good, good question. The shrine is really to blame for all of this, right? Not, see, so there, it's it's a Masonic conspiracy. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Damn it! He caught us. Yeah, um, I, you're not getting out of this one, Mister Mason. <laughs> so, so a couple of things happen to conspire to make the Fez the thing. Uh, one, the shrine adopts the Fez very early on as this Middle Eastern thing, uh, and there's a whole string of Orientalism that happens in the late 1800s in the United States. It's kind of the new mystic thing about the Middle East and understanding that. The shrine adopts the Fez and it becomes very popular. Where this really stems from historically though is the Chicago World's Fair, which happens I believe in 1893. Don't hold my numbers to that exactly. Um, the Shriners in 1893 descended upon the World's Fair where there happens to be a, a mosque erected as part of the World's Fair to talk about Islam. And there's many members of the Muslim faith there. And while not appropriate, the shrine essentially descends on the World's Fair and sort of follows them around and mocks them in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, there's historic records of the, the Muslim folks going in for prayer in their mosque and the shriners following them in, wearing their fezes and sort of a, a revelry. Uh, not appropriate by any stretch of the imagination by today's standards, but you have all of these people from all over the country coming to the World's Fair in Chicago and seeing the, this bunch of rabble-rousing masons from Medina Temple wearing these fezes and riding camels and being crazy, and they go, oh, that kind of looks like a lot of fun. I, I'd like me a silly hat back in my, my silly hat-wearing club. And so th this combination of the shrine making this popular and then you've got enough people who have the technology and the wherewithal to make shrine fez and then they go, okay, I'll take a maroon fez, but I'd like this goofy logo on it instead of the shrine logo. And they go, absolutely, we'll sell you the goofy logo fez for an additional cost. And suddenly this whole cottage industry of fezes is born. So it was like taking the the one original fez and then kind of like if you look at the back to the regalia catalogs like we were speaking about before we uh went and started recording how you'll look and the there's a lot of crossover of uh just for easy production of regalia type items where you could see where they just use the same template and then they just customize either the logo or the symbolism for whatever organization or whatever office so that that makes sense and that's interesting yeah. about the whole World's Fair kind of tie-in with that as well, because the with without a better way to put it, um, for people out there who don't know much about the Chicago, the Great Columbia Expedition of 1893 kind of thing, um, they had a human zoo without a better way to put it. And Sounds at this right. human zoo, they brought people from kind of how Epcot is like where it's different countries. They set up these different little diorama countries and they would bring a group of people from the, uh, from these different areas and set them up in these little dioramas that are kind of fantastical interpretations of what life is in these, you know, different nations that are, you know, big air quotes, exotic, areas that were unseen by uh most people in the americas from that time other than maybe a picture in a book and so I, I could see how that definitely left a very big impression on a lot of people with the like you said the orientalism movement that was very um that was a worldwide western uh movement at that time uh, influenced art tremendously as well um that's a whole other sidebar but that kind of being the flashpoint for Fez's being the hat of all the funny hats in the world to pick that that that's a very kind of a fascinating origin story for uh where that began and kind of we're at a location where there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people seeing them 
riding their camels, wearing their fezes and having the you know time of their lives. That definitely would probably almost go viral. If, yeah, you know, you know, it's an it's an early version of viral. That's a great way yeah, to think of it. Yeah. There's a fantastic book uh, by Susan Nance, N-A-N-C-E, called How the Arabian Nights Inspired the American Dream. Uh, and it's a history of Orientalism and how Western culture sort of poached that and, and made it this own thing. And a lot of that has to do with the Shriners and, and these other fraternal groups. In fact, you know, sort of a plug here, I was just having this conversation with Tim Winkle. Uh, Tim is probably a name that's unfamiliar to most, but he is the curator at the Smithsonian Institution in the United States who, who curates the fraternal collection. So he looks over every fraternal artifact the Smithsonian has. Uh, Tim's a, a friend of mine and a friend of some of the organizations I work with. And he emailed this week and said, hey, do you have any good resources on the history of Orientalism in the United States as it pertains to fraternalism? And this was my go-to book to talk to Tim. Of course, he already had a copy of it and was well aware of it. But for those who haven't heard of it, it's a great tangential fraternal thing to talk about how did fezes and this Oriental movement influence American culture. And the fez has sort of become a cultural shorthand for fraternalism. You know, anytime you want to uh, hearken back to that time when most adult men were in a fraternal order, you just bring up a fez and immediately people go, oh, they must be a part of some secret club. Yeah, yeah, for what it's worth, you know, one of the weirdest things in my, my fez collection is a yellow fez that dates from the 1970s. I bought of all places off of like the Goodwill online auction site, whatever it was. And it, it, it's, it's yellow. And on the front of it is a buffalo that is like a, a light blue color. And I searched for years trying to figure out what the hell is this, this buffalo yellow fez? It's very unusual. And finally, somebody saw it on my website and said, you know, that's from a movie, right? What? It, the, <laughs> the 1970s movie Roller Coaster, which is like this thriller movie about an out of control roller coaster in a lobby in a hotel early in the movie. There's a bunch of African-American fraternal members wearing these yellow fezes with buffaloes on them. That was exactly the shorthand of, look, it's a fraternal group having a convention. And yeah. somehow this movie prop ended up in my collection of, you know, there's probably 10 of them made for the movie and it got to Goodwill and somehow ended up in my collection of this fake Buffaloes group. That is funny. Wow. You know, it's interesting that uh, various pop culture phenomena have created their own fake fraternal orders. You know, the Simpsons gave us the Stonecutters. And uh, I, I will admit, I have played the Stonecutters song for many Lodge installations. And then the Flintstones gave us the Loyal Order of Water Buffaloes. And uh, if anybody remembers the old sitcom Mama's Family, um, they, they had their own fraternal order. I can't remember the name of it now. But it was, that one was very clearly based on the shrine. And so this, this whole method of reinventing fraternalism to, um, to denote something, it always uses the fez. There's always that element of the fez because that is the hat of fraternalism now. I mean, you look around at fraternal orders across the United States, and there's certainly some variations on the silly hat. But really, outside of the, the, the Freemasons' tall cedars of Lebanon and their triangular pyramids, which are angular fezes, for lack of a better term, yeah. and, and maybe the, the moose's short-lived ta, which is really hat spelled backwards for those who yeah. can't do the, the math on that, which is sort of a fez, but sort of not. The fez really is the fraternal hat that became a thing. And if there was ever a fraternal order that had a fun group, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they had a fez. So now this brings up uh, another question for me. Here in the world of Odd Fellowship, we have our encampments. So you go, you get your three degrees in the lodge, then you can join the encampment. So you go join your encampment. Now, I've heard that in the Northeast, it is not as common as it is out West here, but out West, we have our encampment fezes. I have a beautiful 
purple fez with all the rhinestones on it from when I was Grand Patriarch here in Washington, made by Los Angeles Fraternal Supply. And now I want to peel back the label and see if somebody signed it. But uh, <laughs> how how did fezes find their way into our encampments in the Odd Fellows? So, so you bring up a, an interesting point there that that's not a universal thing. You know, I talk to my guys out here in, in Pennsylvania and the Northeast, like we don't wear fezes. Why would we wear a fez? Encampment doesn't wear fezes. I'm like, guys, Facebook, look, look, Toby's got a cool fez. That's Can right. Cool fez. Like, mm. no, we don't do cool fezes. That, we, we can't do that. Um, <laughs> it's just not our thing out here. I, 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 I blame Pennsylvania's Quaker culture that we have to be good and simple here in Pennsylvania. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just how we are. Too much oatmeal. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Steel, steel cut, hardy, hardy German stock, right? <laughs> How do you um, like being the barometer for what's cool as far as headwear goes, Toby? <laughs> I, you know, it's one of the many jobs I have to do as a member of the it's Sovereign one of the, Grand Lodge. So it's one of the many hats that you wear. Exactly. I Holy evaluate sh- headwear. Um, you know, I critique musical arrangements. Um, I occasionally offer sports betting tips. You know, we Ooh. Sovereign Grand Lodge officers, we got a lot of work we have to do. There's much going on that you couldn't even imagine behind the scenes. <laughs> so I know in my jurisdiction of Illinois, uh, the fez for the encampment is limited to the grand encampment. However, in jurisdictions like California, uh, the, I guess, the lodge level of encampment, um, they wear fezes. So it kind of trickled down to any encampment patriarch or matriarch to have the, the fez access. Um, one of my eBay finds that I picked up uh, this past uh, spring, I think, um, was a it was a twofer i got a lodge like a parade garrison cap which is fun um and a an odd fellows lodge fez and so it's you know it's it's not it's not a high-end fez it's definitely like a just the wool felt it's not very stiff it's a little mushy um but i was very and i was just looking on your uh your museum of fezology website that you also had a very similar example to the odd fellow subordinate lodge lodge fez that i have um so do you know anything about um odd fellows lodges using you know a, a, I, I i haven't been able to research anything about the use of the fezes in subordinate lodges other than just the few examples that i've seen and then the one i picked up off of ebay um I love silly hats and I'm I've just feel like half tempted of pitching to my lodge. Hey, let's get some fezes. So what um, do you know any of the history behind that? Or if it was just kind of a like just lodge to lodge deciding like, oh, let's wear this for parades or did we wear them during meetings or do you do you know anything behind that kind of culture with the fez? Yeah, so, you, so you're not far off. And I'll start with Toby's question related to encampment and then kind of draw it back down. So, so remember that for until today, Amos isn't really a recognized part of Odd Fellowship, right? So the Sovereign Grand Lodge doesn't officially recognize Amos as a thing. It sort of exists over here in this purgatory of they exist, but they're not really official, but we're not going to ban them. They, they kind of just happen. Um, Whereas the encampment's always been kind of part of the official Grand Lodge you know, lineup, so to speak, in the, in the branches. And certainly the Golden Rule degree, for all intents and purposes, uh, is a burlesque degree holdover to today. It's, it's meant to be fun and interesting and kind of plays to the, the world that was the, those side degrees. So my, my running theory, and I don't necessarily have a ton of research to back this up, is that you know it was the fun side degree that was officially sanctioned. So when you have a fun side degree, you need a fun silly hat to go with the side degree and what they do. And it's sort of culturally um, part of that world. The other thing I always look at with these groups is where is the center of authority? So traditionally, the odd fellow center of authority is in Baltimore or in Winston-Salem. That's a long ways away from the West Coast. 
So it becomes much easier to have schisms of regalia and things you do that sort of just happen. And nobody from Sovereign Grand Lodge really knows until one day they roll into an encampment in California and go, why are you all wearing fezzes? <laughs> this is new. When did this happen? And they go, oh, we've been doing this for 20 years. And they go, huh, okay. <laughs> <It's, you> know, <laughs> the, the, the farther away you get from the seat of power in the 20s and 30s, the easier it is for variations to occur in all of that stuff. So I think that's probably where you start to see the Fez float around, uh, both in the encampment and then in the Odd Fellows. Uh, you certainly see more of the local Fezes for subordinate lodges and Odd Fellows happen in the Midwest and the Western part of the country. Very rarely do you see that stuff from the Eastern United States. Um, and I would agree that probably a lot of it was parade stuff. It was things they used for public exhibitions just to get more attention. You know, when you're on the parade route, the biggest, silliest hat's the one that gets the attention. So you've got a fight with the Patriarch's Militant and their big chapeaus, the Knights Templar and their chapeaus, the woodmen with their axes, and, you know, <laughs> everybody's got to have a hook. So sometimes yeah. getting a funny hat's the hook. The, the, the parade, the reversible parade ribbon just wasn't cutting it anymore. A exactly. You know, I, I, I think back to when it comes to these changes and schisms, so to speak, not too many years ago, the, the Freemasons in Pennsylvania, um, our, our ritual was taught mouth to ear for several hundred years, meaning there was no written copy of the ritual that anybody could go reference. You had to learn it from a guy who learned it from a guy who learned it from a guy, however many generations back that went. And, and there was a system of instructors and ritual directors who, in theory, you know, they were the authorities on what the ritual was. Several years ago, uh, they sat them down and said, hey, we want you to write the ritual down. And there was lots of controversy over this. I'm not gonna get into that on, on this call, but there's seven regional directors of the work. And then there's a, a, a director of the work. And you would be surprised at how varied their versions of the work were when they sat down. And it's not big versions, it's punctuations, it's commas, it's inflection, all of those things. And the further you got away from Philadelphia, where, you know, sort of the power center in Pennsylvania was, the more varied that ritual became. And it, it just kind of took on a life of its own. It wasn't intentional. And I think that's what happens in a lot of these fraternal bodies. The further you get from the center of authority, the more variation that sort of just happens organically. Now, one thing that I, if you think about it, it doesn't exactly make sense for encampment members to wear a fez. Because the fez, of course, is Islamic. It was the the hat that you could wear that had no brim, so you could bow completely to pray. And all everything we do in our encampments is all based on the symbolism of the Old Testament. You know, it's the patriarchs, it's Moses and Aaron, and wandering through the desert as nomadic herders, and you know that whole kind of uh, Old Testament feel. But then we just sort of added fezes on top of that for the encampment, which, if you think about it, does not make sense. Why would we suddenly add this thing from several hundred years later in history that came from North Africa to all of this symbolism and other stuff that happened in biblical times, uh, basically in the very eastern Mediterranean? So, you know... That doesn't exactly make sense why you would add that on unless guys are sitting around going, well, why can't we wear a fez? Well, let's do it in the encampment. Come on, guys. A purple fez, that would look awesome. And, you know, to be fair, it does, it does. look awesome. Our encampment fezes are awesome. Yeah, it kind of looks like a tent. It <laughs> does. On the top of your head. Yeah, you know, we've got tents and crooks and, you know, the the guardians of the tent and the sentinels and all of that stuff in the encampment. And then a fez, which is from, like, the opposite end of the Mediterranean. Those originated in Morocco several hundred years later. But we're going to wear fezes no matter what. Well, they you, never you, they never said they were good at geography. <laughs> yeah, and if you've taken the encampment degrees, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no geography test in encampment. You know, I, I, you bring up an interesting point, uh, uh, Toby, and 
I would say this has been one of the best pieces of advice I ever received in Freemasonry. Uh, it came from Mark Tabert, who's the uh, curator at the George Washington National Masonic Memorial in Virginia, who said the most important book you can read on Freemasonry is not written by a Mason. It's the Bible. And not from a religious perspective, but from a ritual and history perspective, because all of our ritual and history is really wrapped up in people's understanding of the Bible 200 years ago when they wrote these rituals and brought that about. And the Odd Fellows is no different. You know, their, their writing of this work, take the religious part of the Bible out, so to speak, their worldview was shaped by that book. And it was probably some of, in many cases, the only book they might have ever read or had read to them. So for us to really understand the ritual and the history of what we do, you have to have a really thorough understanding of biblical context to really get it. Oh, absolutely. Because if you think about it, the the odd fellowship that we know today was basically codified in the early to mid 19th century in America. And the most progressive idea that they had at the time was that all of the Abrahamic faiths, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, all came from the same roots, so we can keep everybody happy by just sticking with the Old Testament. That was a very kind of progressive and egalitarian idea at the time, and that has really kind of influenced Odd Fellowship. You know, now, of course, with the world open to much wider array of things, you know, we have Buddhists and we have Hindus and all sorts of religions that were sort of beyond the imagination of a simple coach spring maker uh, in Baltimore in 1819. Um, but it's kind of that idea like, well, if we just root everything in the Old Testament, it'll be good for everybody. Absolutely. And that, you know, you look at the patriarchs, you look at the patriarchs militant. You know, the, the, the competition of the Patriarchs Militant was really three organizations. It was the Knights Templar and the Freemasons, which was strictly Christian uh, in, in its roots. The ancient illustrious order of the Knights of Malta, very popular in the, in the Northeastern United States, who uh, at least historically, and this went away, especially in the mid 1900s, but were very much Protestants. It wasn't, you know, you could, the original rules were a woman if you wanted to be a member of the women's auxiliary, you couldn't be married to a Catholic. I mean, they had some very strict rules. And then the Knights of Columbus, when they instituted the fourth degree in the early 1900s, which was really a result of them facing massive backlash from the Ku Klux Klan of the 19 teens. They wanted to show that they were patriotic, good Americans. So they created this fourth patriotic degree. So you're walking down the street at the, the parade and you start seeing the Knights of Columbus and the, the Knights Templar and the, the Knights of Malta, uniquely the Patriarchs Militant are the only one of those groups really rooted in the Old Testament that tried to figure out a way to bring this chivalric story and wear the uniform and the chapeau and all of that by keeping an Old Testament degree. It's really unique in the scheme of fraternal things at that time. Okay, now, now I have to tell my favorite fraternal joke. And then after that, that will be a perfect opportunity to take a break. Now, I can tell this joke because not only am I an odd fellow, I also belong to Sons of Norway. So I can tell this joke. Sven and Oli are sitting down at the coffee shop one morning. They're discussing what's going on. Sven has been retired for a few years, but Oli, he just retired recently and has plenty of time on his hands. And so... Sven says to Oli, he says, you know, Oli, you should really uh, come down and join us at the Sons of Norway. We have lots of fun down there. We have uh, torsk suppers, you know, with boiled codfish and potatoes. And we have the, the game nights where we sit around and play cards and drink alcohol. And, you know, we have the picnics that we do. It's a lot of fun. You should come down there and join us at Sons of Norway. So Oli takes the application, fills it out, gives it to Sven. Sven, of course, had an application on hand to give him. And, uh, you know, a week goes by, and uh, they meet down at the coffee shop. And uh, Sven asks him, So, Oli, how did it go with your interview to join Sons of Norway? 
And Oli says, yes, man, I, I didn't know it was going to be that tough. You know, there they have the, the section about the health questions. Uh, I put down there that I had the hemorrhoids, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, why do you do that? It's, well, I'm trying to be honest about it. And they, they said I couldn't join Sons of Norway. Yeah, well, it, it makes sense. Uh, you know, we have the insurance and we don't want to pay too much for, you know, folks who show up and have a lot of problems. And Oli says, well, uh, I'm real disappointed. I, I knew that uh, to be a Mason, you had to be Protestant. To be a Knight of Columbus, you had to be Catholic. But I never knew you had to be a perfect ass to be a son of Norway. <laughs> <laughs> Well played. Well played, sir. Oh, thank you. And with that, we are going to take a break. We will be back right after this. All right. Be honest. How much do you spend on coffee every month? $20? $50? $1,500? Well, that's probably not realistic. Anyway, I digress. Where was I? Oh yeah, pig and a pug. For the price of one of your not-as-good-as-last-time lattes, one of your, what is this, 90% milk macchiatos, or about 350 cups of Folgers, you can get yourself some handmade soap. Yeah, handmade. And with the best ingredients and the most attention to detail, that you could conceivably ask for. This stuff smells so good, it will align your chakras, send out multiple namastes, and best yet, make you smell like you don't spend the majority of your time these days walking around in your pajamas. Being that we're all home a lot more these days, we might even just take more showers just because we're bored. And it's fine for that too. Smell good whenever you want. Each order is packed with the greatest of care and includes freebies and loads of positivity. Listen, don't start an argument by telling the people that you love or people that you live with that they stink. Just get them a bar of soap and uh, Robert is your father's brother. So take a minute, pop over to Etsy or Facebook and look up Pig and a Pug. Just bang in the coupon code THANK YOU 24 and you're going to get 24% off your order. Literally, that's all you have to do. Pig and a pug, pig and a pug, pig and a pug. All right, we are back from our break. And uh, Brother Ainsley, I understand you have the shout out for us this episode. I do. Um, the wonderful jurisdiction of Louisiana is on a roll. Let me tell you what, uh, earlier last year, they got Crescent City going, uh, a new lodge to come back to New Orleans for the first time in decades. And in Alexandria, Louisiana, which is kind of in the middle-ish part of Louisiana, right? Or kind of in the southern, south. I, I'm not exactly sure. Alexandria, Louisiana. It's in Louisiana. It's in Louisiana. It's in the boot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. in that boot. Um, it's on Google. Themis, if you Google it, Themis Lodge number seventy-five is their new lodge. So Louisiana's got two new lodges, and Themis is a uh, kind of a a law type lodge, right? Um, they've got like justice with the scales as their uh, emblem. Yeah, because the the name comes from Greek mythology. Themis, I do believe, was the goddess of justice in Greek mythology. Uh, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, I'm just repeating what uh, Brother Eddie told me. <laughs> well, you had, you, had, you had more info than me then. <laughs> there you go. So hey. we want to congratulate our new brothers and sisters at Themis 75 out of Alexandria, Louisiana. Woohoo! Odd Fellowship I, is popping out all over. Absolutely. I think it's interesting that Odd Fellowship is on a roll in Louisiana because you'd think that it would be on a po' boy. Ah! That's true. You know see what get, I did there? Yeah, I, get, I saw. Get yourself some uh, shrimp and uh, shredded lettuce, a little mayo on the bottom, a little hot sauce and, on the top. 
and some slap your mama. Yeah. Oh my. Good stuff. So yeah, we is. got we got brother Seth Anthony here <laughs> with us. Uh, he's been telling us about uh, these various social side orders for odd fellows. And one question that I had about this is each of these various side orders seems to have borrowed, to put it gently, um, cultural artifacts and elements from various different cultures around the world. Um, the trend seems to be for Oriental type stuff, and I mean Orient um, more like the Middle East than the Far East, like Japan or something like that. Um, but that wasn't universally the case. Like the Muscovites were Russian themed and, uh, Amos is a Persian theme. And I find that to be, uh, extremely unusual because it seems like most of the Oriental Anna that was going on was like kind of more Arabic themed than Persian. So when you think about this again, put yourself in that 1893 World's Fair mindset. Uh, we are uneducated rubes of Americans who, who probably did not read very much beyond the Bible that was put in front of us in the newspaper day to day. And they said, we're doing this Middle Eastern thing. The idea of what is and is not Middle East in 1893 America, very malleable to say the least, right? And, and keep in mind, 1893, we still had the Ottoman Empire. So our very, modern very conception of the Middle East as being a bunch of small nations, you know, all over the place, um, you know, 1893, Greece was independent from the Ottomans, but a lot of other places in Turkey, some in Southeast Asia, you know, into the modern day Iran, into Iraq, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, that was all Ottoman land. So th think about this too, culturally, what Fez predates every Fez wearing fraternal body? It's the Civil War and the Zouaves and the, the look they had coming out of New York State, especially the city, where they had these very fanciful uniforms and they were renowned for their, uh, their prowess in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And they wore these very fanciful uniforms with a big red Fez and a, and a blue tassel on it sort of like what we know today, but a thicker tassel. You know, that was the, the height of fashion during the Civil War was this uniform. And a lot of that gets adapted in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, because what, what happens culturally post-Civil War, you had millions of men at war in uniforms, and now you suddenly have all these leftover uniforms. Well, that's when the Odd Fellows and the Knights Templar, everybody says, huh, we could make good use of those uniforms. Let's stick some fraternal emblems on them and march down Main Street. Well, the Zouaves were just as popular in their day. Uh, so it's, you know, you start to see that adaptation for parade uniforms and that the Oriental bands and Oriental marching units in the shrine, especially. And then the early Oddfellows groups did the same thing where they take this cultural touchstone from 30 years earlier and adapt it because it still remained popular. It's just like turning Full House into Fuller House. Nah. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. That's exactly what it is. So basically the whole Fez phenomenon was a cultural appropriation bastardization mixed in with a little bit of Civil War pageantry and then regurgitated out through the lens of fraternalism for fun fashion and parading yeah yeah i mean there's a lot of stuff that that happens in this time frame that you kind of have to look at culturally what's going on so the, i'll use the muscovite busby as sort of the the interesting piece here they call it a busby they don't call it a fez fun fact it's a fez you know you can't it's a fez guys you can call it what you want it's a fez just because it has a weird black band around the bottom doesn't make it not a fez. It's a fez with an extra piece of fabric on it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love the Muscovites and, and you know, the, their fezes are very unique. Um, but you know, what were they trying to, to do with that fez? Well, during the Civil War, you, you had the, the Zouaves and their, their red fezes and all of that, but certainly pre-Civil War and uh, the Napoleonic era leading up to the Civil War that's sort of the end, 
the height of fashion in military world was Hussars and uh, some of those Prussian knights. And I see Toby, you know, you see the big death's head Busbies that they, true Busbies that they wore, these big woolly felt hats that were cool, you know, sort of in their own way, the Busby is then going, all right, well, Joe down the street makes fezes. If I can get a gray one of those and slap a little bit of woolly band around it, it's sort of like the Eastern European Hussar uh, Lancer thing that happened and it harkens just enough to that look while still being affordable. Well, I, I can actually tell you a little bit more about the the Muscovite Busby and how it came to be. Uh, yeah, apparently, sure. uh, one of the, the czars was having a Turkish themed party. I don't remember which one. Could have been Nicholas II, Alexander III, I don't know. You know, all those Romanovs were a little crazy. So, the czar was cold and he's having this Turkish themed party. And so everybody said, well, let's just put a felt band around your fez that you're wearing for your Turkish party. That'll help keep you warm. And then that's how the fez busby hybrid came about was because the czar got a cold head. Well, and then that, you know, that kind of migrated its way uh, with Russian immigrants to the United States. And then, of course, when the Muscovites were looking for some sort of distinctive headgear, they're like, well, that's perfect. Look at that. It's a fez, but it's got some fur on the bottom. So it's not a fez. It's a busby. It's we're Russian special. Fez. It's yes. Russian fez. <laughs> Much better. Yeah, so you, it's, it's all part of that cultural appropriation stuff that, that we're talking about, right? It, it all ties into that. So, you know, the, the Muscovite fez is sort of unique in its own way with that little woolly band around the bottom of it that you don't see in other places. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was still cultural appropriation by the czar's court having a Turkish party. Exactly, you know. And although we kind of have a pejorative view on cultural appropriation nowadays, that is actually how cultures mix and you get cultural interchange is by taking something from one culture and then you introduce it to another culture and there it begins to thrive. And then you get people who look back and go, oh, there are more elements of this culture here. So just because we would kind of look down on the idea of appropriation in the modern era that's also where, for example, people learned the first practical things about what the Middle East is actually like, because they might belong to the shrine and go and, oh, I belong to Syria shrine and, oh, there's actually a country now named Syria. And so you get exposed to those things you would not have otherwise gotten exposed to. So it's funny you bring up Syria Shrine because that's in Pittsburgh. I yes, to, I, I know. I know many past potentates Syria Shrine, but so that's a great a great example. And, and while the Odd Fellows were not as prolific builders of structures compared to the Masons and these other side bodies, you, you think about the Shrine and what they did with that. You look around the country at Moorish revival architecture and Egyptian revival architecture. If it weren't for the Shrine, that really would have never been a thing. Uh, many major cities that have a Moorish revival structure, it's probably the shrine building that was originally built there in that style. And then the Elks picked up on that. There's a couple Egyptian revival Elks buildings floating around out there. There's a beautiful Presbyterian church in Memphis, Tennessee. That's an Egyptian revival church. Uh, they, because of the shrine and their Orientalism, they brought about this interest in Middle Eastern architecture, Middle Eastern art in that look. And I say that now is the shrine in my local city here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Zembo Shrine built in 1929 for a million dollars was just sold for less than a million dollars to an events venue. And it's a beautiful Moorish revival mosque in the middle of the city of Harrisburg that nobody would understand what Moorish revival architecture was if they didn't drive that by that building every day and go, my God, that building looks so different than everything around it. <laughs> That is very sad. Uh, it is unfortunate uh, that your shrine has had to sell their building. When I was in college uh, in Seattle, I went to Cornish College of the Arts, uh, our North Campus was like literally a block away from um, the uh, Scottish Rite Temple, which is on Capitol Hill. 
And we got to have many of our college events at the Scottish Rite Temple because it was big, beautiful building where you could hold events. Eventually, the Scottish Rite chapter decided to sell their building and move up north of Seattle and just meet at the Nile Shrine Golf Club and Events Complex. And, you know, I hate to see those beautiful, wonderful fraternal buildings go away like uh, your shrine there in Harrisburg. So a so couple of fun facts. One of all the fez wearing groups I belong to, I do not actually belong to the shrine. Uh, really? that, that's a whole a whole nother long story. I am not a Shriner. I belong to pretty much every other Fez wearing body but that one. Um, and, and to the point about the buildings, my favorite story about that is actually the old Grand Lodge of DC building for the Freemasons in DC in the District of Columbia, which is now the National Museum for Women in the Arts. That they, they, <laughs> they bought the Grand Lodge of Freemasons building in DC and turned it into that. And they've they've done an amazing job to say, you know, here's a building that was dedicated to a men's fraternity in its day. And here's how we've repurposed it to make it also reflect cultural and women in the modern era and kept both of those things. Uh, so while it's, it's sad that it's not part of the fraternity anymore, they've done an amazing job to keep that history alive and show both sides of that spectrum. Well, that's great. Well, is there anything else for Brother Seth while we've got him here? Anything else we want to talk about? I want to know, since you are the um, authority on fezes and fez groups, what is your favorite fez? That's like asking your favorite child, right? Um, <laughs> I have a favorite <laughs> child. All right. Well, we, we won't make you say that publicly so you don't get <laughs> lampooned. Um <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna name two, uh, three fezes, uh, three types of fezes in my collection. I'm really favorite of, and then I'm gonna tell the fez story that got me into collecting, and I think that's a great way to end because it it really is why do I do this? And a lot of people say why do you collect silly hats? So first and foremost, I love me some Muscovites fezes. If you're on eBay and you're bidding on a Muscovites fez and you wonder who is the guy who's willing to pay more than you, it's probably me. Um, <laughs> I, I have the largest privately held collection of Muscovite fezes in the country. I have one of the only couple of white Muscovite fezes in the country in my private collection. Toby has one. I have nice. one. They're exceedingly rare. Um, I have fe Muscovite fezes. I have one of two or three known ladies of the Muscovite fezes in my collection. They're bright orange, like you're going hunting. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're crazy. Uh, so uh, I am always up for buying more Muscovite stuff. But coolest fez is something different. I will, I will say two, and for two very different reasons. Uh, one that you've probably never heard of is a religious group out of Michigan called the Knights of the All-Seeing Eye. It comes from a, an African-American spiritualist church who is losing a lot of membership to the Masons. So they created their own fraternal fez wearing order called the Knights of the All Seeing Eye, Super and it's cool. a big fez with a big All Seeing Eye in the middle of it. It's that's just rad. exactly what you would think from like we're going to make a secret society and we're going to make a fez that's going to have an eye on it. Um, <laughs> uh, they makes me think of that famous Aleister Crowley uh, it's photo. It's exactly that look, right? Like amazing that's the look of it. And is it on your site? They're, they're, yes, I have one on the site and I have another one that I purchased at auction that I've not been able to post yet. They are exceedingly rare. Uh, it was an early snag for my collection that I've always just loved. And because it's such a small, weird little side thing, I have this little place in my heart for them. My, my truly favorite Fez, just because it's so weird, they always come from the Psyots. And the Psyots are this weird little Masonic side body that developed in California they eventually went to Illinois and New Jersey. I'm a member of uh, a pyramid in New Jersey, uh, but they they had a, a, a marching group called the Libyan Guard, which what a great name, right? The Libyan Guard. It sounds like Muammar Gaddafi is running a fraternal group. Uh, and if you look on my site under the Syots, I have a Libyan Guard fez. They're really hard to find, but it's a three-dimensional fez with this goat's head on the front that's done in wool and it's stuffed and it has a number over it. It really looks kind of goofy when you look at it, not gonna lie, but it's such a unique thing to do on a fez to create this three-dimensional architecture of a, of a goat looking thing on a fez. It's just cool. The other Syots fez I have is something I picked up on Etsy. It's obviously a Syots joke fez where it says Poobah, Fresno <laughs> number 10. 
so you can't you can't hate on a poobah fez right like it's the thing about fez yeah um but but the the final story i'll leave you with how i got into the whole collecting of fezes thing and the thing that you know it's it, it, i'll warn you guys it's a tearjerker be ready and you might have heard me tell the story before on other podcasts but I started wearing fezes as a joke to a local trivia league at the bar in my hometown. We, we played trivia every Wednesday and the fez I'm wearing in the little video, I don't know if you published the video or not, it says 45 on it. it. It was a thing that was short lived on the internet, the order of the fez, which some guy ran out of his house. And basically you signed up to be a member and he issued you a look deep into your heart and issued you a number based upon the order in which you joined, like the stone cutters. And yeah. I was number 45. So I have this Fez and, and that sort of started me on this whole little journey. And while I was uh, doing this trivia thing and wearing Fezes, a friend of mine contacted me and said, hey, there's this flea market about an hour away. I saw a guy who had some Fezes in his booth. You should go check it out. All right, fine, whatever. I, I drove out to this flea market an hour away and you know, after an hour or so of hunting around, I found this booth and there's a, a white Fez beautiful encrusted with rhinestones and a big yellow tassel and it says past grand director b-p-o-r and i went what the hell is a b-p-o-r and it said philadelphia pennsylvania i went oh well that's kind of cool it's got this big deer thing on the front past grand director how much you want for it ah 20 bucks cool 20 bucks later i had me this fez i took it home and about that time is when I said, you know, I'm starting to collect this stuff. Let's make a website because nobody else is doing this thing. And, you know, I've got free time on my hands. I know how to do web design. Let's, let's put this together. So I, I threw this website together and I had it up there for maybe six months, maybe a year. And I said, I don't know what this is. If you know what it is, email me. I'd be interested. Out of the blue, maybe a year later, I get an email to my, my inbox that says, hey, I know about that BPO ARF as I want to talk to you about it. Okay. And he gives me a phone number and I call this fella up and we have maybe an hour and a half long conversation. And it turns out that this guy's now living in Florida. He was an African-American gentleman who grew up in Philadelphia, went down to Florida, we retire. And he said, your Fez is from the Benevolent and Protective Order of Reindeer. And I went, well, what the hell is a reindeer? Well, this is new. Uh, long story short, the moose didn't allow African-American members An African-American member said, we're going to found our own African-American moose. And the moose sued them, said, you can't be a moose. We're a moose. You can't also be a, a large woodland animal. And they said, sure, we can. If we can't be a moose, we're going to be a reindeer. And there's nothing you can do to stop us. And the court said, they're right. There's nothing we can do. So lo and behold, you have the benevolent and protective order of reindeer that grew in Philadelphia and kind of that mid-Atlantic Jersey Philly, Maryland, Baltimore area. And this fellow proceeds to tell me the whole history of the benevolent and protective order of reindeer, why he got into this. It talks about their history, what they've done. They own a building in Philadelphia. They have less than 600 members left. There's not many people interested. Uh, all of these things, how the organization is structured, what my fez meant, just, just really giving of his time. An amazing gentleman, and I really appreciated his time. And at the end of the call, I couldn't help but ask. I said, okay, so this has been awesome. I love learning about this. I love your history. Why'd you reach out? Why'd you call? Why'd you say, hey, call me? And he floored me. He said, if I don't tell you this history today, nobody's going to know it because nobody cares. Wow. And, and that's a really sad moment because he recognized that this thing that he gave his life to was in a death spiral. And every Fez that's out there, every goofy fraternal thing you find, that was some man's life. He cared enough about that organization to buy and wear the silly hat. He dedicated his time, his energy, his money to, to driving that fraternal organization. So whether, whether it's a, a, one of the numberless shrine Fezes you see out there or a, a reindeer Fez, that was a guy's personal thing that maybe his family didn't understand but we as fraternalists understand what that meant to him. And legitimately, we're the last generation that may see some of these degrees even performed poorly. Let's be honest. Yeah. Some of these degrees are dying and they're never going to be performed again. And we're the last generation that's going to get to see that. And if we don't try to save it or save the history of what we're doing, this is it, guys. 
and, and that's why I do what I do. From that moment on, I said, this is a piece of history we have to save because nobody else is taking the time to care to save this. So be sure and give That's out awesome. the URL of your website because everybody needs to go check out the collection. I like to look at it periodically. Sure. So my website is, uh, for my Fez collection, is fezmuseum.com. I've probably got him looking over into the corner of my office. I've got four or five more. He's showing a Libyan guard fez, and he can see the weirdness of the Libyan guard fez. <laughs> it, it's like this. It's got like the weird looking kind of. Uh, it kind of looks like Winky Dink from the Demoulin Museum on the front little there. A little bit, little bit, yeah. So we're gonna have some updates to that. I will be honest that I don't update it as regularly as I used to, mostly because I just don't buy as much as I used to. The collection's kind of at a mature point, but I have a few more things I need to add. So in the next couple of weeks, you'll see an update. Um, I, I also, if we're, if we're taking a minute to give a plug, uh, certainly the DeMolin Museum. I also work with a group out of Lafayette, Indiana called the J.H. Rathbone Museum. Yeah, I've originally heard of them. Dedicated, uh, I, need to get, dedicated, I need to get over there because that's only like uh, two hours from me. Well, the next time I fly out, I will let you know we're working on some work days out there. Oh, um, fantastic. Yeah, let me know because I'll try to meet you up there because I saw that you were doing stuff over there not too long ago. and. Yeah, and I'm, I'm only like an hour and a half from DeMoulin Museum the other way, too. And uh, John's oh, a member of my lodge. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we'd love to have you. So the, Demo the J.A. Trappo Museum was originally dedicated to the Knights of Pythias. It is the largest private collection of fraternal memorabilia in the country. Um, right now, we're in the process of working with the owner of the collection, Dr. Ken Motor, to, uh, to sort and organize the collection with a long-term goal that the collection could become a permanent part of the Indiana University system uh, right. as a private collection there. We're very thankful for Dr. Heather Calloway, who's the archivist for the Indiana University system, who's helping us preserve that collection, as well as many other board members that are, that are doing work there. Uh, so if you ever get a chance to float through Lafayette, Indiana, you want to see the finest fraternal collection and privately held fraternal collection in the country, that's where it's at. Excellent. Nice. So we always end the show with our odd podge but uh i want to check in with christopher here because he usually has a pretty good question to ask before we go to the odd podge you got something for us chris so i got one for you just hypothetical situation here you're you're going out for a, a lovely evening with a lovely young lady and maybe you're going to take her out to go see a movie maybe the departed maybe a movie that's actually good and you can only sneak <laughs> snacks into the movie theater that you can fit under your fez what snacks are you bringing Ooh. with you to this movie so this obviously rules out charleston chews <laughs> or uh you know bags of funyuns and that so we <laughs> you know down we're, we're gonna get it down to brass tacks what are the best ones so, so I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna peel the the lid back on Fez politics for you for a minute. Okay? Uh oh, now we're getting into it. We're oh, getting great. into it. So, no, no, you, you'll like this. So, when okay, good. Uh, in 2011, I founded a new local chapter of the Grotto, a great Fez wearing organization, and uh, we read the Fez rules on the Grotto at that time, and it said it had to be a black Fez, and here's the rules. And I went to my friends at Fezorama <clears throat> and they whipped up one of their short style fezes that looked awesome. And I said, yes, let's go with that one. And we purchased a bunch of them. And then the Supreme Council saw them and went, those fezes are too short. And we said, the rules don't say they're too short. Why are they too short? And their answer was, because we say they're too short. So we had to get rid of those fezes and go back and buy taller fezes that looked like everybody else's fezes. So the question of what could you hide under your fez going into the movie theater really depends on whether it's not a short or a tall fez. Just, a just fez. under a standard sized fez. I got to make this hard. So you, I couldn't fit a bag of Funyuns under here. I might be a little crushed up by the time you're. All done. right, forget it. Forget it. We'll just, <laughs> we're just, we're just gonna now, go with nothing. Now I have an observation that I made. Speaking of snacks and fezes and going to the movies, this covers all three of these topics. That's specific. This is very specific, and you will be yeah. very impressed by this artistic observation. Rolos. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
are merely tiny fez shaped foil wrapped chocolates. So if you're going to the movies, the only appropriate thing I would believe to hide under a giant golden fez would be tons of golden wrapped oh, oh, so you're saying you've got to go out and get a gold leaf look at yes. fez. Like gold so lame, like you're unwrapping shiny. your head. Like, yes. And it looks like a Rolo. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Kind of kind of like when you go to Hershey Park, you could get those Hershey Kiss hats. So I that think it's like a big Hershey Kiss with a flag on it. I think it's one thing to go out on a date to a movie while wearing a fez in the first place. So let's just assume that your date is going to overlook the fact like that you're wearing a fez and just go, oh, yeah, no, 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 totally normal. This guy is just wearing a fez, right? I think it's, it's a whole nother we okay but i think it's a whole nother thing to be wearing the tinfoil hat gimmick out in public <laughs> you know and just go oh yeah no don't worry about my microwave looking hat I i've got snacks in it it's full of rollos <laughs> and if you're really fancy you could fill it with jiffy pop so you've got the rollos with the popcorn combo going so it's all melty after, and chocolate after, and caramel after that I've date, they're getting a protective order. I've seen fezes made out of straw and cork, so just saying. A straw fez? Now, that would be interesting. I have many straw hats, but they all have brims on them. Sh shout out to D. Turin. They make a straw fez now. Really? Hmm. Interesting. Oh, and it, Good for okay. Moroccan news reporters. Now, I have to ask, what is the purpose for a straw fez? If you're in the shrine in the south and it's hot, it's way better than a felt wool fez. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I was going to say, while well, sipping your mint juleps in your white linen suits, of course. You know that I'm buying a linen suit for Sovereign Grand Lodge. I, I'm just guaranteeing Ooh. that. I'm, I'm bringing Hansen the Panama Hansen. hat. I was going to say linen Panama suit, hat, of course. The whole thing. You know, I'm going to stroll in there like some type of old timey Southern lawyer. <laughs> Like are, are you, are you gonna have like a cane and go and like have your Matlock. pants hiked up to like right under like like above your belly button and like right up here be like now I say I say <laughs> man we're gonna have so much fun at Sovereign this year <laughs> I happen. cannot play the piano because I have the vapors boy you're gonna look like a combination of Colonel Sanders and Scarface. <laughs> Somehow, Colonel Sanders is Norwegian. I don't know. How to do that. Uh, what, what, what was uh, John Goodman's character from Oh Brother? We're out there. Or, or uh, I totally yeah. butchered that. Like that. <laughs> yes, just like that. Just yes. Either, either that or um, uh, or kind John of Candy similar... from Cool Runnings. Yeah, kind of similar to that, or similar to <laughs> the the crazy Texan on The Simpsons. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm, th I'm thinking yes. Futurama when they when they go to when they go to trial and I'm just an old Thomas Southern chicken lawyer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the two Utes. Utes. What's a Ute? <laughs> oh there no. You I, you know, and I will know it's convincing uh, if the representatives from places like uh, Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi are like, y'all got to come have lunch with us today, you hear? <laughs> like, Jimmy will be very impressed. Yeah. All right, Foghorn Leghorn, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> He'll have a little kerchief to dab his his, his brow with because it's just My so hot. It's a warm one today, brother. Oh. <laughs> I that say. Was a long session and a deep argument today. Atticus Finch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, we're going to end up turning this into some sort of Somerset mom short story here. <laughs> okay, enough yucking it up here. Let's do our odd podge. Who has something they want to share for the good of the podcast? I can go first. All right, hit us. So as a follow-up to our previous episode with uh, Stacey Thomason, um, 
we have our uh, little Odd Fellows pantry. Um, actually, I'm going to turn the camera over. Hopefully, I'll be able to see it. Oh, it's too high up. There he goes. It's it's backwards facing right now. Um, obviously, the people who are listening cannot view it. But uh, one of our members in our lodge, uh, Brother Steve Cook, has uh, lovingly assembled a little food pantry. And um, me and my noble grand, Tosh, who also works at the tattoo shop, we're going to this Sunday work on decorating it so that way we could get this uh get this thing out into the community for our lodge that is awesome good job and to think the idea came from little old gold hill oregon yeah it's 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 awesome so i'm excited about it all right uh i'm gonna go next uh because uh i have some really big news i don't know if you saw it on instagram or facebook i just got myself another accordion uh, this one happened to come to me from uh, the city of Cleveland, Ohio, which is well known for its wonderful ethnic culture, uh, particularly a lot of great Slovenian polka bands there in Cleveland. And uh, this is a vintage pancordian baton one, a beautiful instrument. Uh, my friend Anthony Sulkar back in Cleveland, he uh, helped me find it and told me about it. And uh so I just got it back yesterday from uh, complete tuning and new microphones going in it. Shout out to Potosa Accordions uh, here in the Seattle area. Joe Potosa did a fantastic job of tuning this box. It is a classic Cleveland style instrument. So I'm really happy you got this new instrument and uh, hopefully I'm going to be working on maybe doing some recording with it in the not too distant future. Nice. Thank you. All right. Uh, who else has something for the odd pods? Christopher, you got something to share? I do. I do. Uh, so as I'm sure that you guys know, I spend a lot of my time traveling the world, right? Yeah. A and uh, you also know me uh, and that I am uh, a huge, huge fan of all things vape products, right? Of course. Absolutely. Uh, so I found myself in the Philippines recently, and uh, I was all out of my baked ziti flavored vape juice. Okay. And I, yeah, and I said, "What on earth am I gonna do? I desperately need this." I had stuffed shells, I had lasagna, but those, you know, I need, I need the baked ziti vape juice, right? Now the others don't have enough basil or oregano flavor. This is what I'm saying. Uh, so <clears throat> I used my my wide net of Oddfellows related resources. House of Clouds vape shop in Quezon City in the Philippines, owned and ran by Oddfellows, and they have everything that you could possibly need to to vape, to do large clouds of things. Uh but they have probably every flavor available in the Philippines. And it's all, you'd be helping odd fellows that are doing amazing work as well as supplying the Philippines with all things to make vape clouds. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the flavors are not available in the United States anymore, right? Is that I have no idea. I've never actually vaped anything in my life. I just wanted the opportunity to give this uh, vape shop a, a shout out. Oh, okay. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah. So thanks for blowing the lid off of my whole I, story there. I, I'm sorry. I, I was totally oh, like this buying is, the big the... ZD flavored vape juice. And I was. This you is the worst birthday I've ever had, but it's pretty close. <laughs> Oh my god. I didn't even know you had a birthday. Wow, that's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> all right, brother Seth, what do you have to share with us for the odd podge? Uh all I know is I need to uh, introduce brother Christopher to brother Isaac Moore of the Masons in New York City. I think you guys are two clones. One's a Mason, one's an odd fellow, and you guys will get along too damn well. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't I don't get along with Masons. 
Uh, well, I, it's I like oil and water. I just, I that. just refuse to like Masons. <laughs> um, I, I will add for the odd pod. You, know, you guys talked about some great things you're doing for your lodge. One of the things we've been trying to do here in Pennsylvania, we've had a, a certainly before the pandemic, we we saw a lot of issues in the news with uh, our local coroner's offices and other uh, organizations Ooh. not having the resources to bury the dead locally. Uh, as one of our missions, they were having a lot of unclaimed bodies and bodies where the family just said, we don't have the resources to appropriately bury this person. And frankly, a lot of it's related to drug overdoses and deaths where there's not a lot of organizations that are willing to kick in on those on those uh, burials. So we've been looking at ways we can assist those organizations and, and locally with the coroner's office to say, you know, what, what can we do to help these families who are in crisis, uh, who are being overlooked by the system to help provide a, an appropriate burial for these people because that's part of our our tenants as odd fellows so if you're looking for a project for your lodge i would encourage you to think about that that might be going overlooked in your area that's fantastic yeah that is really wonderful and it speaks to the the deep wonderful traditions of odd fellowship well, Brother Seth, I want to thank you for coming on the uh, Three Links Oddcast and joining all of us and sharing your voluminous knowledge about uh, the various side orders for Odd Fellows uh, and all of your wonderful Fez experience. Uh, it's good to know that we have qualified scholars uh, when it comes to Oriental headwear. <laughs> well, well there, there, there's not many that are qualified, and I will say... So you guys are on the West Coast, so it's 11.53 on the East Coast. At midnight, I'm like a gremlin. I turn into a, a terrible creature, so you're just in time. Ah, all right. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, brother. Our next episode, we are going deep in the heart of Texas. We are going to talk with brother Ivan Kotcher and uh, possibly another guest from Dallas Lodge number 44. We have a huge number of listeners down there in the Lone Star State, so we're finally going to show them some love. And uh, Brother Ivan is going to talk to us about the way his lodge in Dallas has interacted with the local arts community and how that has paid benefits both for the lodge and for the community. So on behalf of all of us here at the Three Links Oddcast, I want to thank all of you for listening. <laughs>